Hi, I'm Askit here, and today we're going to be talking about 2017's updates. It's been a bit of an awkward year, with expansions starting and promptly being cancelled, the start of unfinished business, the spam of microtransactions shifting into what is promised to be a much more acceptable policy, we'll see how that works, and a serious lack of updates this year. But in this top 10, we're actually going to be talking about the good updates. In this video, I'll be covering what Krondis, Avernic, and Walters Kong, and I think are the 10 best updates of the year. Additionally, just want to take a moment to do a little bit of rebranding. We've been discussing a new name for a while for the channel, and we've chosen the Society of Owls. This is a reference to the RuneScape novels, chosen specifically because Reldo is the archivist for this group. And we've got a new channel intro up on the channel if you're interested in learning more. Hopefully you guys like the name as much as we do. Anyway, without any further ado, the Society of Owls presents our 10 best updates of 2017. Coming in at number 10 is a smaller scale update from early in the year, Skill Cape Perks. Created by popular demand after the success of Old School RuneScape's update, this update added, well, perks to each skill cape when worn or activated. Some are more useful than others, the Agility Cape and Crafting Cape seem especially useless for instance, but the Slayer Cape is wonderful. But overall, this update added a great reason to get those capes back out and put them into use. Additionally, the Completionist and Max Capes can hold three of the cape effects, making them even more useful. At number 9, we chose the Gemstone Dragons. Initially, these were absolute trash on launch. But after some quick fixes to their loot, and the release of a 120 Slayer making Hydrix Dragon's XP no longer halved due to no longer needing a boost, these have quickly become a well-valued task in the higher Slayer range, providing incredible experience with a not-too-shabby fight as long as you stay out of melee range, and a really nice-looking environment. The gems payment for non-slayer tasks kinda sucks, especially since these guys drop very little worth going for, but it being free on slayer tasks is nice and appreciated. Unfortunately, the gemstone armor they drop is not valued highly at all, which isn't a huge surprise considering how useless the set is overall. The lack of augmentability and the cost of effects makes the set really not worth using. Making the set augmentable and providing a chance to get charges by killing the dragons would be a nice way to breathe some life into the set but the armor being so useless definitely holds these guys back. Additionally, these guys got a little lore boost with the drop table update of the Motherload Maw, providing a little bit of insight as to how these guys were created. Stuff like that is always really appreciated, and I was really delighted to see them tied in. At number 8, we have Menophos. This one comes with a bit of an asterisk attached. Menaphos also turns up on our worst updates list, sorry, spoilers, and only about half of Menaphos is part of this discussion here. What is actually number 8 for us is the Crocodile Tears quest, which is the second best permanent quest of the year for us, parts of Our Man in the North, some of the skilling content itself within Menaphos, the beautiful graphics work, the Menaphos journal, the majority of the Sophonim Slayer dungeon, the Grand Library, and the personal Slayer dungeon, or the Sunken Pyramid. For such a divisive update in the community, it definitely succeeded at major parts of what it set out to do. The skilling updates are fantastic for mid-level players, really opening up those levels for players around there. This kind of update was super healthy for them, and we can do nothing but praise Jagex for the addition of them. Quest-wise, Menaphos was mostly awful. There was one bright spot in Crocodile Tears, which was a nicely done quest, with some fetch quest elements that had problems, but overall was the most cohesive of the stories told within the city. It was paced well and did a good job progressing the story. I would also like to praise the opening half of Our Man in the North, with the story progression there. Unfortunately, the quest then whipped through story content and contained downright awful gameplay overall, but I at least wanted to shout out the little bit of the nice part. The graphics in Menaphos, on the other hand, are beautiful. I can barely say more than that, but the environment team blew it out of the water. Incredible work. The music is the same way, with a series of gorgeous music tracks, including several tracks with lyrics and singing. The Menaphos Journal was another fun bit of collecting, just like the Ark Journal, and it was really greatly appreciated. I thought it offered a little bit extra life to Menaphos that was very needed. The Sophonim Slayer Dungeon was just fine as well, with some decent Slayer monsters and some decent drops with a nice loot mechanic. The mobs themselves aren't really anything special, but they're definitely not a downside here besides being a higher level copy-paste of several mobs in some cases. 
Once you get to the higher level monsters though, they start gaining more unique mechanics, and I really appreciated that. The Grand Library was awesome, containing a ton of great lore books, and I can do nothing but cheer getting a legitimate library on this scale in-game, especially with player-written contributions to the books. Finally, much love to the Sunken Pyramid, which seems to have been inspired by an older suggestion of mine, and I'm so happy to finally have it in-game. It's a fantastic piece of content and does nothing but help players who really enjoy being able to customize their slaying. Overall, Menaphos is a mixed bag, but the great parts really were great, and I'm really glad it ended up being an update this year. At number 7, we have The Lost Grove. With some nice, small-scale lore, three extremely good Slayer monsters, a spectacular new glove slot item, mind-blowingly gorgeous graphics that absolutely blow everything else that's in-game out of the water, and a perfectly fine new minigame, the Lost Grove was overall a really quality update that will hopefully be even better as a location when Solak, the new boss coming in 2018, launches. As things stand, we're super happy with this update overall, and are glad it helped fill some of the 120 Slayer gaps that desperately need it. The way each monster was balanced to cater to different needs was also great, and it was a nice experiment that I'd love to see continued in the future. Really my only complaint is that a lot of the landmass seems a bit underutilized, and I'm curious to see where the real story is going to go from here, as things feel a little empty at the moment. At number 6, we sort of cheated and bundled the Easter event, the Cotton Tales, and the Halloween event, Ghost Stories of Gilinor, together. I'll discuss them separately, but they're each included due to the lore that each event contained, while still being a holiday event, and I didn't feel that that justified needing two slots on this list. The Cotton Tales was definitely the weaker of the two events in this list, and it has less puzzle content overall, but the silly jokes lead to an actually very emotional finale, and the lore eggs really did a great job of expanding the backstory of a few races or groups that really needed it. The ending did a really great job of calling back to past Easter events while adding a really sweet emotional heft to the story. It gave us a real reason for the event taking place. It was nice, and really appreciated. I just wish it was possible to get the story eggs from this event added permanently somehow. I think it would really expand the world overall. Ghost Stories, on the other hand, was heavily focused on a series of disconnected puzzles, with some story for each one and a great lore book attached as well. The big benefit of this event was that while it had a spooky feeling, the overarching emotion was more one of melancholy, especially exemplified in the story of Closure, the kind of story hub character of this whole event. We're also just super sad this event wasn't kept in game permanently after the poll failed due to the 75% yes requirement with 60-something people voting yes. I still think this would have been perfect content to remain as a tale rather than a quest, and the lore here was super valuable, adding some backstory to some characters from the RuneScape novels, and some callbacks to some events from the past, plus just overall game extra story. Both of these events contain some really great lore, and I do think they'll be missed. I hope there's an opportunity for this lore to return in the future somehow. At number 5 is Nex, Angel of Death. This year had a wealth of PVM content. Some good, some bad. But a real bright spot of this year was the spectacular Nex, Angel of Death boss encounter, released back in January. Not only is this boss fight rich in lore, with two, now thankfully easily accessible lore books, but the fight itself is among one of the best released in the game, making full use of the evolution of combat system. The fight really rewards with incredibly valuable drops, including a tier 92 main and offhand mage set, three level 95 prayers, and a set of hyper rare cosmetics that are wonderful looking and well worth the rarity. Plus, of course, a boss pet. The fight is super well balanced around seven players, but it's freely massable with up to 50, which is a really great way of offering an open bossing experience for many players who are interested in diving into this more high level type of encounter. Mechanics-wise, this boss is a home run, with a bunch of really cool mechanics making use of the lore of Nex and her creation, styling around the ancient magic's elements. The way the fight can be customized in a way, based on the order of minions killed, is really fantastic as well. The prey souls and the pillars add a great wrinkle to the fight, plus the variety of dangerous mechanics that players have to avoid really keep you on your toes the entire fight. 
The way mechanics escalate as the fight progresses, with Nex slowly absorbing more and more power, is extremely intense and is super well characterized not just in her dialogue above her head, but with the way your team has to react. This is personally one of my favorite boss encounters in the game due to the fantastic tie of mechanics with character and lore, with a great story, a beautiful boss room, and really nice drops. This is PVM as I hope to see it in the future. At number 4, we have Imp Catcher. What? Yeah, yeah, sorry, no. I know Imp Catcher came out in 2001, but back in March, Mods 2 quietly reworked this horrid little quest into something quite nice, managing to work around the voice-acted dialogue restrictions and somehow managed to give us the best quest of the year. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. This year's been kind of awful for quests though, after a solid year in 2016. It's kind of wild that a little rework of a 16-year-old novice quest managed to turn out so strong, but here we are. Taking the barebones idea of imps and beads, we ended up with a really fun little story dealing with four imps characterizing the four humors, sanguine, choleric, melancholic, and phlegmatic, and four cute little puzzles. Mods 2 really did spectacular work taking one of the worst quests in the game, even included on my worst quests video on this channel a while ago, and turning it into a fun quest that is really well worth playing for everyone. Well done. Please keep at it, Stu. We love you. Thanks. At number three, we've selected Invention Batch 2. While a bit of a mixed bag in terms of overall usefulness, this update finally made Invention feel more complete as a skill overall, and helped justify the 120 level cap over the 99. Machines are much appreciated, adding some nice benefits for players investing in using them. Making levels 11 through 20 useful on items was a massive benefit and really helped provide value after a player no longer needs to siphon or disassemble their items. New devices like the Divinomatic, Gizmo Bags, the Equipment Separator, and the new Teleport items were really great additions to the skills and added a lot of value to endgame invention. Additionally, the adding of the Spring Cleaner to invention was hugely needed and was a really great choice. The removal of inspiration was also a huge win for the skill overall, and removed an extremely clunky aspect of the skill, helping smooth out the level curve. While not part of Batch 2, I'd also like to shout out the Hammertron and the Pyromatic for adding some nice skilling options to Invention. It's nice to see this skill feel valuable to the overall game, and not have so much dead space. So well done guys. It's a shame that Expansion 2 had to be cancelled, but I'm glad that Invention Batch 2 was salvaged out of the wreckage, I guess. Still not sure what that expansion was, and I don't know if we'll ever find out, but I hope we do someday. Either way, I'm glad we got invention out of it. At number 2, coming in hot, we have Achievements Batch 2. After the disastrous Achievements rework, destroying the task interface, making it impossible to track new achievements, and offering essentially nothing unique, new, or special, Achievements Batch 2 blew all expectations out of the water, adding rune score, better categories, an easier to read and dare I say great interface, and a number of new achievements to chase. This update absolutely revitalized achievement hunting for the game, finally offering more options than just the task system. It's been great fun hunting new achievements, ranging from fun little challenges to challenging boss feats, and all the way to item collections. I'm always excited to see new achievements added, and I'm excited to see how the system, and potentially even rune score rewards, maybe, is expanded in the future. It's really nice to see achievements broadening outside of just area-specific ones, and I really love what happened. It's a shame that it started out so rough, but in the end, they did get there. So I'm not going to do a proper honorable mention section on either list this year, but I did want to give a quick shout out to a couple things. So yeah, shout out to the buff bar, the drop rates reveals, boss collection achievements, combat pets, and the free to play expansion update this year. All that was good stuff. Nice work to everybody involved there. These were fairly small scale, so they didn't make the main list, but I did want to mention them, though I wasn't planning on doing a full shout out section. And here we are. Imaginary drumroll, please. The number one update of the year was also the first real update of the year as well. It's Memorial to Gothics. Starting the trend of fantastic lore books really augmenting an already strong piece of content, 
Memorial to Gothics was a fantastic expansion to Divination, encouraging training the skill while fundamentally changing parts of the skill for the better, creating excellent choices for players with skill perks. Not only are the graphics drop-dead gorgeous, but hunting the engrams, discovering the really spectacular story, and unlocking a wide variety of unique perks for Divination is really engaging. This is seriously one of my favorite skill expansions ever, and it really added nice depth to a skill that felt a little lackluster. The cosmetic unlocks and the visual display of engrams was really awesome though. But the lore was the winner for this update. And yeah, sure, it sounds a little biased since we are a lore channel, but seriously, it was awesome. <laughs> Reveals about Guthix's thoughts? We got it. Reveal of the identity of the balance elemental? Check. Reveal about a previous world guardian through a tie into armies of Gilinor? Right there. Lore about the spirit trees, we got it. We even see how Guthix discovered Xanaris, destroyed Renmark, met the Druids, used the World Gate, broke the Elder Sword, and even how he felt right as he accepted his death. Memorial of Guthix was a fantastic finale of sorts to Guthix's story, and is one of the best combinations of lore, story, and skilling ever released. Well done, Jagex. I wish the rest of this year's updates were as strong as this one. Memorial of Guthix really set a high bar, and None of us believed that anything else had surpassed it this year. Let's hope 2018 grows a little better than this. So, here we are at the end of the 10 best updates of the year. As I said at the start, it's been a bit of a troubled year for the game, so hopefully this video did a good job of showcasing some of the stuff that really did go well. Even in a year with some weak content, we got some great releases, and hopefully Jagex learned from their failures and from their successes. Thanks so much for watching, and check back soon for our 10 worst updates of 2017 video. This has been a Maskit from the Society of Owls, and thanks for watching. On your screen now, you can see each individual member's top 10 list as well, if you're wondering our personal thoughts. Do enjoy!